Whether you love it or hate it, Dragon's Dogma 2's Endgame is certainly an interesting take on how to do Endgame content. It has some very nuanced and confusing mechanics baked into it, and in true Dragon's Dogma fashion, it does not explain any of this to you. In this video, I'm going to go over some essential information about the Endgame itself, along with some tips and tricks I wish I knew and that I would recommend you consider before you progress the game into its Endgame state to ensure you are ready to take it on. Before we progress, Progress. Disclaimer, this video will contain a lot of spoilers, so please do stop watching here if this is something you really want to avoid. I will say this though, folks, I really wish I knew some of these things before I progressed. Some of it is pretty frustrating. Now, let's get into it. To begin with, an explanation of how Endgame itself actually works will hopefully help you decide if it's something that you want to leap into or stay in the campaign longer. This will give the tips more context for you to work with, and if you're still interested in jumping in, I'll also explain how to gain access to this part of the game at the end of the video if you don't already know. So, what is the end game in Dragon's Dogma 2? Essentially, once you reach end game, the entire world is still open and is now falling apart. It's also inhabited by new and extremely dangerous enemies and new types. Drop rates and amounts are increased, so you can buy things like wake stones, berry stones, gold, worm crystals much easier. After playing for about an hour, I had around 10 fairy stones. That's a kind of indicator of how much stuff starts to ramp up. The map itself is now also changed, so where the sea was is now a new location called the Seabed Shrine, and this is where the Dragon Forge now resides. This is where you can spend your worm crystals, grab all that fancy high-end endgame gear. Very exciting, folks. Within the endgame, you have approximately 12 in-game days to complete a quest line that involves interacting with red beacons and completing tasks and boss fights. These are distributed throughout and around main cities. There's this kind of red fog that is slowly enveloping the land, and once the 12-day timer is up, you are effectively forced into NG+. Bus. The catch here, folks, and this is where things start to unravel a little bit in some ways, is the saving mechanic is completely changed. You're no longer able to auto-save. Camping no longer allows you to rest and rejuvenate your health. But here's the kicker. If you die out in the world, you will either be given the choice to reload the most important in save or start from the very beginning of the end game again. A lot of inns also don't appear to have the functionality that they used to in the campaign as well. So this makes traversing the world all the more dangerous. So essentially, if you die when you're out in the world, that's it. You either start again at your hard save at the inn or you start the whole process again. It feels like a bit of an odd attempt to create a roguelite. So hopefully that's giving you a little bit of context around what we are working with here. On to the tips. Number one, do not rush into it. So this first major tip is perhaps a little bit obvious, but please do just be really mindful of all the things that you want to do in your playthrough that perhaps you won't be able to once you roll the game forward. I went in blind and found out the hard way with some of this, but I'll share those with you. On the flip side, I was also also really pleased with some of the decisions I made to delay the starting of the end game to focus on some personal areas of interest within the game. Some of the most important ones are coming up now. Secondly, level your vocations up first. Do the majority of your leveling and grinding of vocations before starting the end game. I've pushed mage, sorcerer, thief, archer, mystic spearhand to nine and took the warfarer to six. My advice here would definitely be to look at pushing the mage and the sorcerer regardless of of whether you're playing them or not to max rank that augments folks are just too good to pass on in my opinion. I also think the same about the Warfarer's rank six vocation, Zeal. When you combine all the stamina augmentation, the offensive options and the caster augments can give your Arisen an absolutely crazy advantage. And I think it's just far too good to pass on. I'm maining a Mystic Spearhand and I'm so glad I had the timing before I went to Endgame. Consider what you're trying to achieve and perhaps what else you might want to experiment with in the near future and make your choices from there. I knew personally I was going to experiment with raw damage output and some elemental base builds in the near future, which is why I've made the choices I have. Trust me, this is really worth considering, folks. Number three, maester quest lines. Before you roll into the end game, get all your preparations in order in terms of gold and maester skills. I would 
fully recommend completing the Spellbound and the Sorcerer's Appraisal quest lines if you're planning on using Mage and or Sorcerer as a main pawn or a main itself. The rewards are Maester spells and these are absolutely S tier. Maelstrom and Meteoron for the Sorcerer both absolutely shred. Maelstrom is superb at chunking down large enemies health bars and quite literally deletes large groups of enemies in the blink of an eye. I haven't used Meteoron as much but it offers some excellent explosive AoE damage. Celestial Payan for the Mage gives an insane party wide stamina and damage reduction buff that can allow you to pull off some huge damage burst windows when it lines up well. Just try summoning the Mage or the Sorcerer with these skills and give them a test if you're curious before taking the plunge. This is what I did and I was very quickly convinced. If you want these maester skills, both of these quest lines involve grabbing loads of tomes and if you want to complete both in one playthrough, you need to make forgeries of these in Checkpoint Rest Town. It's quite a large time investment, but it gives you some awesome exploration and insights into areas of the game. It really feels like a proper adventure and it's a really great opportunity to level up your other vocations like I mentioned in the previous tip. Gold, Drakes and Worm crystals before you go into end game do not and i repeat do not spend all your gold and worm crystals i cannot stress this enough there is so much stuff in there for you to choose from that will cost hefty amounts of resources to buy and upgrade due to the way the save system works you won't be able to roll back to rectify this and you will be kicking yourself i've done a quick price check and if you're looking to buy a full end game set of gear from the dragon forge the total cost of worm crystals is 230 so make sure you are farming drakes and lesser dragons as much as possible before you arrive. Give yourself the best opportunity here. The endgame gear itself brings back some old fan favourites from DD1 and I think the armours look absolutely fantastic. On top of this, the vendors in the main towns are now selling new gear for gold, which you may be interested in for both style points and some alternative weapon options. The Mystic Spear Hands, Frost Elemental Duo Spear is an excellent purchase, and the Holy Enchanted Heaven's Key for the Thief are some other exciting options here. You also need buckets of gold for forging and upgrading your gear, so please be mindful of that. Coming in at 5, if you're looking to optimise your gold amount, make sure before you go into endgame that you sell all your Jasper, Tiger's Eyes, and Onyx at the right location. What do I mean by right location? Well, if you didn't know, each mineral will sell for more in specific areas. For example, Jasper sells for 2,800 a pop in Batal, Onyx goes for more in Vermouth, and Tiger's Eye more with the Elves. This makes for a superb cash injection. You're going to need this to buy items, and you're also going to need a lot of it for your forging, so don't sleep on this, folks. Speaking of forging, did you know that there are four different types of smithing styles that you can upgrade your weapons and armor with, each giving slightly nuanced and different stat gains depending on which one you pick? These styles are Vermundian, Tali, Elven, and the hidden style, Warven. Essentially, Vermundian offers a balanced allocation of stat points on weapons and armor. Tali emphasizes physical defense and strength gains over magic. Elven is the opposite of this, prioritizing magic defense and attack, whilst Dwarven is balanced like Vermundian, but it also offers us increased stagger potential and knockdown resistance. You should absolutely ensure that you unlock this by completing the side quest. Put a spring in thy step. This starts here, I'm showing you on the screen now, and starts a chain of escort missions and also unlocks the magic arch of vocation. So, what's not to like here, folks? Dwarven smithing appears to be the best choice when upgrading armor, and in most instances, it's also an incredibly solid choice on weapons unless you are a caster. A quick punchy one for number seven make sure you place port crystals at key locations. You may want to revisit during your time in the end game. For example, I've placed one at Medusa's cave because I want to get that preserved Medusa head. I also placed one at Checkpoint Rest Town. It's really important to note, folks, that ox carts are not functional in the end game, so make sure you keep this in mind. Coming in at eight, complete any quest lines that you are keen to do. I didn't do the Sphinx quest chain and I am now kicking myself. I took a risk and I knew that that might happen and that's my fault. I thought I'd just communicate that with you folks because it's something to consider. Items can still be found in their locations though. I grabbed the lightning daggers from Windswept Gully during the end game for example and I would strongly recommend with this in mind 
that you do the majority of your exploring and any quests that you are interested in completing in your playthrough before you roll across. Nine, please do not fall into the trap I did. Do not spam rest in inns because this progresses the fog that I mentioned at the beginning of the video to spread across the land. My first run in endgame, I had a networking error and as a result, kept trying to save and I didn't realize that every time I was saving, I was actually losing parts of the map. Incredibly frustrating because I had to start again. Speaking of starting again, and this also happened to me, so I'm sharing it with you, so hopefully it doesn't happen to you. During my first attempt, I went in completely blind, kitted my spare hand out with gear, went on a rampage for a few hours, eventually died, and it rolled me back to my last save, which was the inn at the beginning of my journey. I was devastated. I lost about four hours of progress. So please make sure if you hit a point in progression that you want to keep, make sure you hard save at an inn. And on this point, folks, make sure you save straight away as soon as you enter the end game. That is just not worth thinking about. Number 10. So you've made it this far and you still want to get into end game. How do you do it? I will keep this part short. Before you return to the excavation site area in the campaign, ensure you have God's Bane sword in your inventory. Essentially, at the end of the game, when you're given the choice to fight the dragon or run away, choose to fight the dragon. Once you're on its back, climb along it, go around under its belly until you find the glowing area where its heart is. Open your inventory, use the God Bane sword, and you'll send yourself and the dragon into the ocean below. This activates the true ending quest lines and the end game. Enjoy yourself, folks. If you're looking to do some insane burst damage like a whirling ball of blades, check out my Thief build. It's got you covered. Take care of yourselves, keep having fun, and I'll see you in the next one.